laboratorial epidemiologist. Also joining us today is our interim CMO, Dr. Bob Leon Guerrero. Also with us today is Annette Uggen. She's our Bureau of Communicable Disease Consortium um, Administrator. Uh, sorry, Control <laughs> Administrator. Um, so um, I just want to remind everyone that the um, format for today is Dr. Ann will go ahead and present her weekly analysis of COVID-19 for data. And then after that, we'll go ahead and go into our question and answer round, uh, one round, and we'll go ahead and give everyone a chance to uh, ask their questions. Um, if you haven't already done so, you can go ahead and go into the chat and uh, give your or, uh, state your name and the media organization that you represent. So we'll go ahead and begin. Let me just give um, share screen permission to Dr. Ann so she can go ahead and take the floor. All right, the floor is yours, Dr. Ann, thank you. Okay, this is this week's report. Uh, as you can see, we're averaging still about 1,000 tests per day and our seven day rolling average positivity rate is hovering at around 10%. And as you can see, it's been a decrease since this is a whole month's worth of data, which is good. The cases by day, again, we're seeing um, a drop even in the positivity of the seven day rolling average. And so this is good news. Car score fluctuating around 16 to 17. Oi, sorry. By age. Um, as you know, last week we saw a little bit of an uptick in the 0 to 11, but that's since dropped. And there's going to be a little bit more about uh, that later. Uh, but all groups are showing a decline except for the 40 to 49 groups kind of steady with the 0 to 11. A little bit of an uptick in the teenagers, but we'll take a closer look at that later. There's been a slight increase in the past couple of days with hospitalizations. Uh, as you can see, and a little bit of ICU, we're, we're just watching that. But again, we'll just wait. I'm going to show you, give this, put this into context. This is only a month's worth of data. No real change in the proportion of people with or without symptoms. Again, we're seeing um, a lot of asymptomatics. That's characteristic of Delta. And of course, we're still seeing breakthroughs. Now, somebody was concerned about that uptick in the kids, so we took a look at that, and we looked at three weeks worth of data, and what we did see in um, the kids is a kind of clustering among this age group from five to 11 years old, as opposed to the teenagers. That group is a little smaller, but we would expect that because they're being vaccinated. So the younger kids, it's the under 11 group mainly, but it's, again, clustering there. What we're also seeing is with the kids, about half of the kids under 18 minors are reporting household contact as opposed to the rest of the age groups are hovering around one fourth reporting household. So the older groups have much more uh, diverse contacts in the workplace, of course, and the community. And then I put this together so you can see, because there was concern about the kids, oh, there was a slight uptick there, but that has since dropped. I put that in black. What's interesting to me, this is from uh, this is during our surge, this recent surge, and as you can see, the 0 to 11 group really parallels the 18 to 39 group and the 40 to 59 group. Almost, it almost mirrors the, the pattern, whereas the older people tend to have a, a similar, you know, they had a little uptick here with the 60 to 74 and the 75 group, and that's since gone down. And then the teenagers are kind of at a lower rate. Now, hang on, I'm going to show you something else. This is from the master database. You can also look at this in our dashboard. And this is the whole pandemic to date. And as you can see, um, these are the cases during our last surge last year. Again, August, September through November. And then what we're seeing August, September, October now. So there's the cases by day in blue and the seven day rolling average. 
What's interesting is even though we're seeing a slight uptick in hospital, it's nothing like we were seeing before. And the death rate was much higher too, although the deaths look pretty bad here as well. And the ICU, again, it was, we had a lot of more problems last year, but we are still seeing problems at the hospital. But we are seeing a decrease overall in hospitals, except for this little uptick. We are watching that. And of course, for breakthroughs, we don't see any breakthroughs until we start vaccinating. And this is the big picture where we did really see starting really in August with the Delta surge. We know it's Delta. We have evidence that Delta is circulating. That's where we start to see a lot of the breakthrough cases. And then by age, again, this is last year, the biggest surge last year during our surge was in the 40 to 59 group. Whereas in this, um, this case, the most recent surge, it's the 18 to 39 followed by the 40 to 59. And of course you're seeing all groups are seeing a decrease and we hope this continues its uh, downward trend. And again, you can see most of this is on our website, on the dashboard. I believe they might be uh, updating the website as the dashboard. That's it. All right, thank you, Dr. Ann. So we'll go ahead and um, move into our question and answer portion. We'll begin with CJ Pilarka from PNC News. Go ahead, CJ. Hello. Hi, Dr. Ann. So my one question is, how much does, the, so your, the, the chart that you showed us with the spikes, um, they were both within, um, within basically, it, they both started in, I believe, August, and then ran for until December. How much does your data suggest that the spikes are seasonal? That's really hard to say. Um, I really don't know. I do know that what we observe in, in the US and Hawaii eventually hits us here. So there's a different kind of season. Over there, it was, uh, you know, it's fall, here it's rainy season. I really don't know. But we definitely, um, this is the kind of pattern you expect to see during a pandemic where you see surges that surge up and then go down and they surge up and go down. And it's likely we might see more in the next year. But that's the pattern of uh, the 1918 pandemic, which lasted about three years. I really don't know if it's seasonal or if it has to do with, um, um, you know, what's going on in the States. It's just, it's been brought here. So how much does, um, how, how does your data compare to on the national level? Dr. Dr. Hope, I'm muted. Muted. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, they've also seen surges similar to this. It looks like this, but it, ours is a little bit, uh, it lags behind by about a month. That's all. Like I said, we keep an eye on what's going on in the US and then Hawaii because eventually what's happening there starts to happen here. And it did. So I remember last week you said that your, those little ticks on Sunday um, are because there's under reporting. Is that factored into your data or do you discard it as um, an outlier? Uh, we don't discard it, we include all the data so that you can even see the little dips here that have to do with the reporting on the weekends. But what you do is you, you just leave it there and you look at the overall pattern. Because the pattern is what is revealed by the data. Those little blips don't mean anything, even with the, the age group. That's why I, I don't think it's important to look at what happens over a few days because there might be a little blip up or a blip down, but the overall average is, is telling us something. So we look at the patterns, not necessarily the little blips, because you can also put this into like a smooth curve, which is what you, what you see with the age groups. Yeah, you see these little blips, but the overall pattern is up and then it's now decreasing. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Polly Suba from K57. 
page. Thank you so much. Uh, as far as the exposure and household community workplace, and then none reported. None reported is actually highest. That is cor correct. We don't have data on every single case. It's impossible to track all of that. Um, but when we do a case investigations, we try to get as much data as possible. Yes, we don't. Some of the people just also don't know where they were exposed. Right. So could that could that possibly um, just looking at these numbers, how high they are, like 75 plus is none reported 71.2. That's a that's affecting all the data because we don't know where that really is. Household, community, workplace. That is correct. We do not have complete data on where everybody was exposed. That is correct. Okay, and then uh, my other uh, question is probably for the chief medical officer, uh, um, Dr. Bob, on monoclonal antibody therapy. Uh, Senator Frank Bloss Jr. put out a press release stating that there was possibly um, people turned away. Uh, do we have, because I just saw on the JIC report last night that you guys put out a a questionnaire if you qualify for um, monoclonal antibody therapy, do we have enough for the amount of people that do qualify at this point? Are, or um, are we in fact turning people away? We are not turning people away, first of all. Uh, my experience here on Matizan and where the testing, one of the main testing sites are, and whenever we have people that are high risk, uh, I go to them, talk to them, try to convince them. Uh, also, when we get clusters, like we had an episode where uh, one of the construction uh, uh, groups had about a 30 plus um, outbreak. I called up the, I personally called up the, the officer in charge and, and offer the uh, monoclonal antibodies to anybody in their group that uh, uh, qualified for it. And at, as, of day, at, as of today, I've not received a word back. So we're not turning anyone away. Uh, the only thing is that sometimes people who are testing negative uh, request for the monoclonal antibody because they maybe had an exposure. And we're not there yet, but we are uh, thinking about starting to give uh, people who are, are not yet positive, but uh, had a uh, close contact with somebody with positive and they're, they're high risk. I mean, I still, uh, yesterday I, I talked to a husband and wife, both in their 50s, both have high blood pressure and both said no. So we are not turning back anybody. Uh, based on Senator Frank Bloss's uh, letter to even Congressman Michael Sinicholas, are, is, is it that detrimental to get uh, Congress involved to get us more monoclonal antibody therapy um, to to keep that moving forward. Do we need an Do we need our congressmen to to um, basically advocate for us? At this point, pro pro uh, probably not, because like I said, we were anticipating uh, that we could give at least uh, forty to sixty a day. The most that we've given would be about somewhere between 20 and 25. Lately, we're down to just giving around 10 to 15. So um, we're, we're trying to encourage the clinics that do the testing to, uh, if there's any hint of that there might be high risk, to send them over to the clinic at uh, Manilao to get the monoclonals. Um, but I can tell you, even here at Tiza, the amount of people that qualify, the ones that are high risk, have been decreasing, thank God. And I think it's that's because the overall rates of this disease is, is decreasing thanks to the boosters. And, and hopefully those that qualify for the boosters are getting it. And, but we, yeah, we're seeing less and less. So uh, I don't think it's a problem of uh, supply. If it does get close to that, then yes. And then we will ask our, our partners to see, to, uh, see if they can help us get a, get more, but at this point, it's not a problem with supply. And we're not we're not oh, having an issue. 
Uh, it's just to clarify, we're not having an issue with our with them giving us the supply. At this point, no. I mean, we have more than enough. Got yeah, it. Yeah, Polly, I just wanted to add to the part of the reason why we also included that in the JIC release is the, because we wanted to encourage more participation, more referrals, especially if they qualify. So that's part of the reason why we included that in the JIC release as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Any you more too. questions, Polly? No, no, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Next, we'll go to Phil Leon Guerrero from the Guam Daily Post. Thanks, Janella. Uh, I did have a question about um, the positive cases among our children, especially uh, with the data Dr. Ann shared for those who are too young to get a vaccine. Um, I'm wondering if a significant uh, amount of children testing positive too young to get a vaccine uh, reported household contacts, if there's any medical advice or other advice that uh, public health officials can give if parents or older family members that work, if we need to change any of our behaviors to help prevent passing COVID onto our children that are too young to get vaccinated for it. Um, sure, as a, matter, as a matter of fact, two months ago, we were telling the 18 to 39 group and the 40 to 59 group that they should be vaccinated to protect the kids. That was two and a half months ago when we started seeing a lot of dead on arrival people and we didn't know if we had Delta and yes, we're starting to see a decrease. We really need to be at 99.9% .9 vaccination and soon as we can. And the next group that we're gonna be vaccinating is the kids, five to 11. We're gonna be starting in the middle school. So we still need people to get vaccinated. We're seeing still a lot of elderly people uh, dying. Uh, there's a higher risk the older you are, no matter whether you've been vaccinated or not, because as you get older, you have chronic conditions. So even we need to, these are unnecessary deaths to my mind, if we can get people vaccinated. The other thing is the older you are, some of your risk is more, the, even if you're vaccinated, than an unvaccinated 30-year-old. There's a new article in the New York Times Magazine that talks about this whole kind of risk by age group. And so we still need to get everybody vaccinated. I, I want to see us at 99.9. .9. I, I kind of uh, agree with Dr. Pawlitsky. Um, you know, when I see people, uh, kids at, at my, in the clinic at Public Health, I always ask the parents if they're one, if they're vaccinated or not. And, and the, I'd say the majority are saying no. And I said, so I put it, I kind of make it a guilt trip. I said, if you, do you want to protect your, your family? Do you want to protect your kids? Do you want to protect your parents? Do you want to protect your grandparents? The best way is to get vaccinated. Yes, you may not get sick, but you can pass it to somebody who can get uh, hospitalized, arrive DOA. So you got to think not of yourself only, but think of your kids and think of your elderly family members. And, and that way, if you get uh, vaccinated, you protect them. And then the more people that get vaccinated, the less, obviously, you, you won't be able to expose your kids, you won't be able to expose your parents or grandparents. And I think that's what Dr. Fabisky is trying to get at is, when you look at the data, the kids that are uh, mirror the 18 to 49 year olds. And that's the parents. And that's the, the reason. And most of the exposure for the five to 11 year olds are coming from the parents. So if you want to see your kids protected from COVID, if you want to see your parents come back uh, protected from COVID, if you want to see your grandparents protected from COVID, get vaccinated. Not for you so much as for your family members. Thank you. I understand that uh, vaccination is clearly the ideal um, advice from, from our public health officials, but considering it's still a personal choice, I'm wondering if there is in the event that uh, someone with children just choose not to be vaccinated, if there are other steps to protect them, whether it's uh, delayed contact with the child, extra uh, hand washing. Uh, I, I'm just trying to figure out what are the alternatives to being vaccinated if there's other behaviors that we can adopt to protect our kids additionally. The only problem with the hand washing, the wearing a mask, which is very, very important, is that if you're at home 
how often are you going to be wearing the mask? Realistically, how often are you going to, I mean, you don't want to hug your kid. You don't want to hug your parents. And that's how, that's how difficult it is to maintain the, the social distancing. And especially if you have a, come from a house that's multi-generational, um, you, you have, it's not unusual to have 10 to 15 people in a three bedroom house. Social distancing is practically impossible. You're not, and again, you're not gonna be wearing your mask. You're not gonna, I mean, you're gonna be hugging or kissing your family member. That's just the island way. I mean, I always told people before uh, when we had, you know, the flu, I, I normally don't get sick when I see sick kids unless my family member is sick because I still want to hug them. I still want to kiss them. So the social distancing out the window. So the only thing that they can do in, in my eyes is if they want to protect their kids, again, vaccinate because you're not going to social distance from your child. What are you going to do to a two-year-old that runs up to you and say, hi, mommy, hi, daddy. So get, stay away from me and stay six feet away. There's no way that can happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, Janelle, if there's other rounds, I'll, I'll reserve my other questions for that. Okay, sure. Thanks, Phil. Uh, we'll go to Joe Titano from PDN next. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this question is not strictly about the data, but um, I'm wondering, uh, yesterday, uh, the FDA just uh, gave the EUA for the vaccine for kids 5 to 11, um, and Shima gave us a little update, um, and we know that public health is kind of planning on that rollout. Um, and so I was wondering if there are any other updates um, that we could get at this point, like uh, what can parents kind of expect? Is that going to be available for them sort of in the schools, um, that sort of thing, and what that, what that whole uh, project is going to look like, um, presuming that the CDC eventually is going to also give some recommendations? Uh, and that can probably correct me, but usually what happens is the FDA, that was the advisory panel that gave, gave the go ahead, but the FDA has to still meet. And I think they're meeting on Friday, Saturday, our time. And then the CDC will meet uh, the first week of November. So, and then you, after that, uh, the CDC will have to change their EUA to incorporate the five to 11 year old. And that usually takes about a day or so. And then once that's done, then they can start shipping. Uh, we've already put in our order. Uh, we actually put in our order. We were the, according to Dr. Thane from CDC, we were the first jurisdiction to do that. And uh, it does take about five to seven days. Once the uh, vaccines are, are ready to go, it takes about five to seven days for the vaccines to arrive on Guam. You can chime in on that uh, and if I made any mistakes. No, you were right on point, Dr. Bob. Um, and yes, it's, it is this twofold process. FDA has their advisory committee. The FDA director approves it or disapproves it. If it's approved, it moves on to the advisory committee of immunization practices, which advises the CDC director. So once ACIP uh, uh, makes their recommendation, and CDC accepts that or expands it, like what happened with the booster dose, then that's where the jurisdictions now have the official guidelines that we can move forward with vaccinating. But as Dr. Bob mentioned, the pediatric formulation will not be released until the uh, fact sheet has been updated because now we are dropping the age recommendation to five to 11 year olds. And the formulation for this pediatric group is actually less than what's currently out for the general public. So again, those updates are required before we can put a shot in the arm of anyone less than 12 years of age. We are in the process of coordinating with both Guam DOE. We will be reaching out to our Catholic schools as well as the private and charter schools on how can we best coordinate implementing this five to 11 year old campaign, uh, be it school-based or maybe doing it on a Saturday. Uh, we are working again with our healthcare partners. We can't do it without them at the private and public sector to help us uh, vaccinate their pediatric patients when they see them at the clinic. Um, and so those are things that we are trying to have a multi-pronged approach so that when we do get the go, go ahead for the five to 11 year old, there will be multiple opportunities for parents and guardians to bring their, their children five to 11 year old. I, I know Dr. Bob has mentioned or Dr. Ann has mentioned, yeah, we wanna start looking at maybe phasing it in. We wanna start maybe with those 10 to 11 year olds and then work our way down. Um, and, and so that we can do it in a coordinated manner. Uh, and reach all the individuals. Uh, yes, we are the first uh, US API to put in our order of 7,500 doses of the Pfizer pediatric. 
And again, that's that's not enough for our population because they need two doses. Uh, and so again, we wanna do phased in. And then as we are allocated more vaccines, we would definitely order that and continue with this five to 11 year old campaign. Um, so we can close this gap because it's it's, this is what we would call cocooning, similar to what we would do for influenza vaccine and the pertussis vaccine, is try and immunize those who can get the vaccine to protect those who can't. Thank you. And I just wanna reiterate, uh, uh, and that's, uh, we are not waiting for the approval. We are actually already uh, organizing meetings with GDOE and uh, uh, private schools. So, and uh, we're getting data from them to kind of get an idea of how many uh, children and the reason why we want to do it in 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 phases is because as Annette pointed out, we're only going to get seventy five hundred, and that's the max that we can order. So obviously we can't vaccinate everybody. So we want to hit the uh, groups that are more at risk, and that's the ten to eleven year olds, and obviously also the people, uh, the kids that have underlying health issues. So we want to hit them first. Uh, and then when, as we get more vaccines, we can lower them to the, uh, the age limit until we get a coverage of the five and six year olds. Thank you. And I know one of the, one of kind of the big um, hurdles that we have to get over is, you know, obviously you need parent, parental consent. So along those lines, is this gonna be the kind of thing you're gonna have to have come into school or wherever the testing site is with your kids? Um, or is there gonna be like parental consent forms, that kind of thing available? Uh, just Yes, sir, that is a requirement, especially for minors. It must be the parent or legal guardian. So we have an ongoing school-based immunization uh, program with Guam DOE uh, for routine immunization. So that, that again is uh, something that we would tap on to implement this campaign for the five to 11 year olds. And again, it's something that we wanna work out with DOE uh, because there's different options that we can do. Do we wanna do it during school time? Or do we wanna do it like on a Saturday and have a bigger event and this will allow the parents to, to come in and, and um, uh, be with their child when they're receiving their vaccine. In the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, we actually did four school-based immunizations for the H1N1 flu vaccine. Uh, we did it elementary, middle, and high school with DOE. Uh, and again, their process is in place. Consent forms are sent home via the school to the parent or guardian. It's turned back in. Should we be doing it during school time? If it's on a Saturday, uh, then uh, parents again can come in and fill it out on the spot to uh, for their child to be immunized. Thank you. All right, appreciate it. I'll hold off. Oh. There's another round. Thank you, Joe. Daniel Perez with KUAM. Yes. Hi. Good morning, everybody. So uh, I just have a couple questions about the CDC team that's possibly coming tomorrow. Um, Dr. Bob or maybe Janella can answer this. Um, do you know how long they'll be staying? I'm not too sure. Yeah, so they're, uh, I believe their deployment is from October 29 to about November 20th. Um, and they are slated to arrive tomorrow. Uh, I don't know exactly what time their uh, flight arrives, um, but we are anticipating their arrival tomorrow. All right, and uh, as for the FEMA that's currently here on, on island, currently helping with vaccination and the antibody treatment, um, have they been extended? Uh, yes, they have. They were supposed to, I think, end uh, the first week of November, and I think they're, they're extended. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but I think they're extended till maybe the third or fourth week of November. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Bob. Thank You're you, Janella. welcome. All right, thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> um, okay, I, do, do we have any other questions from any of our media members? Uh, yes, I have some uh, questions. If... Okay, go ahead, Phil. Thanks, Jenna. Um, so on uh, the upcoming visit of CDC officials, I, I did wanna ask um, what type of information is public health already gathered or is in the process of gathering to, to help try to understand better um, the relationship between what seems to be a high uh, death rate, death on arrival, a dead on arrival rate and, uh, alongside our very high vaccination rate. I, I'm just wondering, you know, what type of information 
might be helpful uh, for these visiting officials to try and bring some clarity to, to what is uh, what could be confusing for a lot of health officials and residents out there. Yeah, so you know the, the problem that Guam has that's unique to Guam and not to the mainland is that we have a high number of, of comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, and, and the whole island knows this. With the other th issue we have is that our density, um, not too many places in the states will have uh, multi-generational families. Uh, it's unusual. Uh, I mean, most, a lot of them live in different states. Uh, where in here in Guam, not only do we have the kids, we have the parents, we have the grandparents, and sometimes the great grandparents. And all of these things contribute to, so uh, the death rate. And then uh, of course we always have these, uh, the island, oh, I got a, just a cold, it will eventually go away. And so they don't seek help until too late. So all those factors I think contribute to the high rate of immunization, I mean, a uh, high rate of infection, even though we have a high rate of uh, immunization. And uh, I think all that information will be handed over to the CDC. Um, I mean, we pretty much understood why we were getting a high rate of infections and a high rate of DOA, but it's always nice to have fresh eyes look at it and just reaffirm, yeah, that's what's going on. And I think uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm sure Dr. Publisky will also- DJ Santiago. Confirm yeah. that. Yes, we have- the, the data on the dead on arrival, only five of 42 cases as of today, there might be another one. Um, that's only 12% were fully vaccinated and all of them were either very old or had multiple comorbid conditions. So again, I was talking earlier about age and risk. The older you are, the riskier it is. We had one person in their eighties who died, who was partially vaccinated two weeks before. That's too little too late since these are free vaccinations that have been going on since you know December of, of late last year. So it's partly comorbid conditions and it's partly age. The older you are, even if you're vaccinated, you're still at risk. Old age confers a lot of, your body starts to break down. If you're in your 80s or 90s, I hope you're vaccinated and hope you have your booster. But we can't protect everybody. There are breakthroughs, but the, the rate is lower than the breakthrough cases in the general population. And we're looking at all of that data. We've already looked at it. The other problem is when you have someone who's dead on arrival, we don't have a lot of information about them. They're dead on arrival. We have to wait for the death certificate. So even if the CDC comes out here, I only have information on about half the cases. So that's one of the issues we struggle with. If, if I may. Yeah, if I may add, uh, another thing too that I, I would definitely ask the CDC team to look at is the timing because people are hearing, yes, the individual dead on arrival or, or recently deceased had two doses of the vaccine, but it's also the timing. As Dr. Ann mentioned, you know, the person had partial dose uh, just two, you know, two weeks prior to passing away. An individual may have two doses, but was already exposed. And again, the body takes at least two weeks to respond to that vaccination. So if you're just getting your second dose, but you were already exposed, like Dr. Anson, it might be a little too late. So that's another factor to the look at is yes, we have high vaccination rates, but whether were these deceased individuals partially vaccinated or fully vaccinated and fully vaccinated meaning two weeks prior to like their symptom onset or being diagnosed, they already had that second dose. But if you just got your second dose yesterday and now you're symptomatic, that vaccine not helping you because that means you were exposed prior to getting your, your second dose. And so those are other factors we have to look at is the timing of when these individuals receive their vaccine, right. if at all. And again, the right. data has shown with the change over the past year, the different variants, the dewaning de uh, effectiveness of the vaccines. And that's why with all the new latest up-to-date information, booster doses were put out. First it was Pfizer and now all of it, you know, we just recently had Moderna and Janssen. Uh, also that the, the announcement last month of additional dose for those who are moderately or severely immunocompromised. So again, you didn't properly respond even though you had the two full doses. So we definitely wanna encourage individuals if you are eligible to receive that third dose, be it an additional dose or booster dose, please come and get it and then encourage your family members who are not yet vaccinated 
are not fully vaccinated to come in and get and continue and complete their series. Thank you. Here's another way to look at it. 88% of the cases that were dead on arrival were unvaccinated. That's almost nine out of 10. I'm also curious to, to know um, if, if there's opportunities to learn from jurisdictions that have uh, similar circumstances to Guam. I know Dr. Bob mentioned our rates of non-communicable diseases that lead to um, our, our uh, deaths having, um, uh, just ha having health complications that, that can lead to uh, greater severity of symptoms for COVID. Uh, I'm thinking about the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands in Hawaii as similar jurisdictions that live in multi-generational households that have similar uh, rates possibly to these non-communicable diseases on Guam. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you've either confirmed or, or would sort of ask CDC to look into what these jurisdictions are doing similar to Guam or different from Guam that could lead to the different uh, death rates and different infection rates we may be seeing from these similar jurisdictions or comparable jurisdictions at least? Well, I think the Commonwealth of Northern, Mar Northern Marianas is actually a stricter uh, protocol than us. Uh, they're, they're, whether you're vaccinated or not, you still have to get a, a test before you enter the Commonwealth and you have to be uh, quarantined until if you're vaccinated, maybe three or four days after arrival, you repeat the test, and then if you don't pass, I mean, if you pass the test, then you're, you're allowed to uh, get out of quarantine. Uh, but uh, so there, they have more restrictions of, on, on uh, incoming uh, uh, visitors or incoming uh, returning uh, residents, uh, as opposed to what we have. Uh, if you look at Hawaii, uh, yes, they, ha they, were, they have similar comorbidities, but I don't think they're, uh, uh, unless you're looking at the native Hawaiians, I don't think there have as many multi-generational families, homes as uh, Guam does. And yet I think their rate is much higher than Guam's. Uh, I think they were having more problem. In fact, I, I think their, their hospitals, hospitals were uh, on the border of, of being uh, in the, uh, declared in an emergency. Uh, so um, it, it, it's similar. But they're dissimilar. I mean, um, immunization, again, I just want to point that out, it's really important. I mean, uh, 2019, Samoa had an outbreak. They had over 80 kids die from the measles because their immunization rate ran from 95 down to 35. Yet a hundred mile, a little bit over 100 miles away, you had American Samoa had only two cases of the measles, no deaths, just two cases of measles. The difference is the immunization rates. Uh, American Samoa is a, is a U.S. territory, so they had to maintain a high immunization rate. Uh, American, I mean, Samoa was is an independent country, so that kind of point. And, and you know, you have the same genetic background, same. So it just points out that uh, immunization is very, very, very important. I can't underscore that how, how important it is. I wanted to add to that it, this in the CNMI to add to what Dr. Bob mentioned about their uh, quarantine protocols. They're, because of their quarantine protocols, uh, perhaps, uh, there's no community spread of COVID-19 there. Yeah, so I guess that the question would be, uh, would there be a request for the CDC to look into these differences in policy and whether there's a causation or correlation between the difference in case rates, uh, the difference in death rates, between Guam and the CNMI, between Guam and Hawaii? I guess, I mean, again, looking at, uh, you look in the States, there's different rates of, of uh, deaths, different rates of, of uh, infection in, in states that are immunized uh, over 80% and states that are less than 50%. I mean, so you see that even in the in, uh, mainland. So um, um, my guess is this is just the same like, uh, as in Guam too, and the CNMI and Hawaii. All right, thank you, Phil. Any other questions from our media? Uh, sure, I've got a few. Sure. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so one thing um, we haven't heard about for a long time, um, there was, I think maybe earlier in the year, this was more of a common thing, but um, the availability of um, over-the-counter antigen tests, I, I think especially now that um, we're kind of moving from talking about, you know, pandemic to endemic is what's been going around the last couple of months. Is there any thought on public health side, um, this is something that people have been kind of talking about nationally, in terms of you know just making say antigen tests uh, that people can easily use more available or uh, you know some people have suggested you know something like brushing your teeth right uh, if you can take one every three days i think at nih they said uh, something like 98 percent sensitivity to COVID. Um, so yeah is there any thought uh, to that uh, among public there are home tests already available people are using them you have to purchase it. Right, but it, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, maybe implementing that as kind of a broad strategy or, you know, uh, considering that um, for the public is kind of a policy, not, you know, to say that's a policy, but, you know, um, sort of the messaging, I guess, for how to potentially deal with COVID. All right, I'll take that as a no. I mean, um, we, no, I <laughs> mean, Bob, we... We're having hard enough trouble trying to vaccinate uh, with, uh, people uh, to tell them that you gotta buy a uh, COVID test in order for you to go somewhere. I mean, that they're already uh, there's only uh, 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 problems with just getting them vaccinated, just coming here to get the test. Um, I'm, I mean, it it would be helpful, but uh, I don't think pe people will buy it at a, a bulk rate because they're just they're not, they're not just wanting to do it. Yeah, I, you know, I think, uh, Joe, perhaps the, the answer to that would be, you know, there's nothing that would stop a consumer from purchasing a, a home antigen test. Um, now, whether or not an employer or a GovGuam employer would accept that test is, is a different question because, uh, you know, in order for you, if say, for example, you're an employee who is, um, submitting to weekly testing, you still have to uh, submit um, a, a, an acceptable form of testing. So if you want to do it for peace of mind, um, you know, th th that's up to you. So there's nothing that stops an individual from purchasing an at-home test just so that they can confirm whether or not they're positive. But official tests, still, you still have to go to uh, an official place that does, um, you know, antigen testing or PCR testing. So I, I, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, all right, yeah, appreciate it. Sure, any other questions? Thank you, Joe. Any other questions from our media? Uh, yes, I do have one question for Dr. Ann. So Dr. Ann, um, since the Pfizer booster shots first came in, um, you've been saying that there's been a decrease in cases. Do you think that it has to do with um, the Pfizer booster shots? Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Um, since there's been a decrease in cases recently, do those have, have to do with the recent introduction of the Pfizer booster shots? Uh, I think it's a combination because eventually a surge will burn itself out or do you start to see a decrease uh, because they're seeing the increase in cases, uh, people who've kind of relaxed the, the, the safety measures that we've always emphasized, right? Wearing your mask, stay home if you're sick, cover your cough. The, when they see the cases rise, they start you know, um, increasing their, their safety precautions. Um, uh, and again, People are getting more tested. They know if they're, you know, they're exposed or not. They're taking them at social distancing and, and following that. And then we implemented this other layer of uh, prevention, which is yes, the booster dose. So I think it goes hand in hand. Um, you know, media has been pushing it out. Thanks to you all and to uh, Janella and, and the communications team again about we're in a surge. You need to take the necessary precautions. Uh, and eventually, after several weeks, we'll see cases go down. And so by adding in this booster dose, we hopefully, you know, will help bring that, bring that uh, decrease faster. Uh, but again, it's, it's a combination of factors. Sorry, Dr. Ann, if I cut you off. 
No, no, that's that's fine. And what we're we're still seeing though, the highest rates, uh, case rates are in the 40 to 59 group. And again, this we had this upsurge in the kids who are ineligible. Not a lot of people age uh, 40 to 59 might be eligible for a booster unless they have uh, comorbid conditions or they're immunocompromised. But now it's available to everybody. We really can't say. I would hope that the booster is helping. It might also be that people are listening and the 18 to 39 group is also getting vaccinated. So it, it's possible, it's a combination as, uh, and I agree with what Annette said, that it's a combination, these things tend to surge and then the decrease happens. It could be a combination. And I haven't looked at the immunization data lately by age. So maybe we'll do that in two weeks. I won't be, I won't be available next week for this, but others might. Thank you so much, Dr. Ann. Thank you. Uh, one thing I also wanted to add uh, to Joe's question about the uh, at home test for uh, rapid antigen test too is that, you know, one of the things and we've never really put some thought into this is that, you know, what happens if your test turns up positive, how do you report it. Um, so those are other thoughts uh, to put into that so, you know, uh, although, you know, nothing does stop an individual from uh, purchasing an at home test. Uh, you know, if you do do that and you turn it positive, uh, that, that's one thing to think about. Also, testing is widely available in Guam. It's readily available. You can get it. We offer it every single day. Uh, there are multiple locations to get it done. Um, so that's another reason to, uh, you know, why we partly why we don't um, it, uh, promote it or have it here. Um, so that's another thing to think about as well. Um, any other questions from our media? Yeah, I have um, just one. It's not necessarily data driven, but since we have uh, all you fine folks from, um, I, I, I just, you know, there's a lot of holidays coming up uh, starting at Halloween through the end of the year. And so I'm wondering, um, based, I guess, based on the data, what are the odds that we're going to see any relaxing of pandemic restrictions that you guys would recommend, uh, including the increase in social gathering size limits, considering All Souls Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas is all coming up? Do the numbers bear that? Is there anything that we can shoot for, like strive for five, to have a bigger Thanksgiving or Christmas? <laughs> I think with the, the, the curve going down, I think if you add on, hopefully the immunizations of the five to 11 year old, uh, that will also contribute. So, because the more people that cannot pass the disease, there's less likely it can't be passed. And um, so I think, you know, I don't know for sure, because I'm not the governor, but I think uh, the restrictions will probably be uh, loosened uh, as long as people continue to at least do the smart things about, you know, wearing masks and still do the smart things about social distancing otherwise. Um, so I might, my guess is yes, but, uh, ho and hopefully, like I said, with the vaccinations of the five to 11 year old and people realizing that the older people realizing that it, they can help stop it too, if they get vaccinated. But I think it might be released, uh, loosened. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then just one more uh, question from our media. Any other, any other individual wants to ask? Okay. All right. No other questions. That'll do it for this week's data with Dr. Ann. Thank you, Dr. Ann. Dr. Bob and Annette for being here this week. Uh, as Dr. Ann had mentioned, next week she's not going to be available. Um, so we won't have Dr. Ann joining us next week, but we'll see about the possibility of doing one or maybe not. We'll, we'll, I'll let you know for sure next week whether we'll have another one next week. So uh, thank you to our members of the media and also to the public for joining us this week. I will make the slides available to everyone if you don't already have a copy. Uh, well, that'll do it. That'll conclude Data with Dr. Ann. Thank you again. Have a great rest of your week and stay safe. 
address. Thank you for asking those difficult questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you.